We're talking with Dr. Roger Thomas, recipient of the CFPC Lifetime Achievement Award in Family Medicine Research in 2013. Good morning, Dr. Thomas. Good morning, Stephanie. I have a first question is, how did you become interested in research? Um, I realized as a, I have a PhD in sociology, so I have a very strong interest in research, and it's a very, very excellent program at Yale, emphasizing research. And when I went into medicine, I realized there was a huge amount of evidence out there that was not summarized. And that's, then I started to work with the Cochrane Collaboration, um, which is really, I think, the premier organization worldwide with about 30,000 researchers systematically reviewing work. A strong emphasis on equity, looking at um, research from West Africa, from Serbia, from Croatia, from all countries around the world to make sure evidence is available to citizens around the world. Mm -hmm. So your uh, work in research has partly been focused on systematic reviews. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about systematic reviews. Why are they so, so important to family medicine? They take all the literature in the world, in all languages, and very carefully assess the risk of bias. We don't use quality anymore, risk of bias. So you look at randomized controlled trials, cohort studies, case studies, time series sequences. If we look at um, uh, randomized controlled trials, they vary greatly in how well you can trust them by the risk of bias. So the randomization should be done by a, a strong method using a computer. The randomization should be concealed from the researchers so they don't know which group it's in. The patients ideally should be blinded. The researchers should be blinded. By the way, eye doctors use the word mask. They don't use, I've just done one with them. They don't use like judiciously use the word blinded. Okay. The assessors, supposing I got arthritis, somebody looks at my fingers, they shouldn't know which group I'm in if they're imply uh, using a scale. The statistician should be blinded. Um, uh, there should be no attrition. He should have every data point on every person. Nobody should drop out of the trial. And then the Cochrane looks very, very carefully at what happens if there are problems in these areas and how to assess the risk of bias in the data. And then all the studies can be summarized using different methods so that you, shall we say, you've got 20 studies with 500 in. You've then got a huge study, if you can amalgamate them, if you can pool them, with 20 times 500. And you can actually say what the approach is worldwide if, the, uh, if you summarize the literature. That's very, very helpful. Okay. What, what are the challenges? It sounds like um, a large large amount of information, a huge job to do a systematic right. review properly. What are the challenges? Hard to get funded. It's a little bit easier now, so you do it on your own time. Secondly, doing the search. Some of the Cochrane groups will do the search for you. They're very, very expert. Otherwise, you do the search with an expert librarian. You may get four or 5,000 abstracts to go through, and I can tell you, it doesn't do your eyesight any good to go through 500,000 abstracts independently to figure if they're part of the review. So some... Uh, Reviews will have a narrow focus with search terms that produce a much smaller number. Some will produce a huge number. Then you, um, by the way, you've already worked out a protocol. You've reviewed the world literature. You've decided what the research question is. It's gone to three world experts who come back at you and say, we disagree with your summary of the background. We think your research question should be this. We think you should evaluate the the research in this way, we don't agree with the way you pull the methods, how you're going to handle heterogeneity, how you're going to handle this, that and the other. And so it's the, exactly the opposite of a typical publication where you send it in and the editor says, and the reviewer sent you four pages, we wish you hadn't done this, could you please go back and correct it? So it's actually the right way to do it, is to have three world experts criticize in depth your method and then they actually look at your completed review and say whether you've done it. It's just like as with a journal, you have to satisfy the reviewers. So those are really the problems. And then the problems begin with the quality of the data, the risk of bias in the data. And I'm, I mention that in certain systematic reviews I'll come. The, 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 the problems are different with each field. Okay. So you, and speaking of uh, fields, you've done systematic reviews in quite a large range of mm -hmm. fields. Um, what have been two or three that you think have been the most valuable to family medicine? Right. So I've done 17 systematic reviews, eight of them are Cochrane. So uh, I've just done the third edition of Interventions in Schools to Prevent Children Smoking. And so I work with colleagues at Oxford. 
and the University Electro Medical Statistics as a statistician on the project has been very, very helpful. And what we decided to do, we went back over the entire world literature in all languages, and I translated the languages that I speak, and we got other things in translation. And what we did, we, we got a cohort of students who'd never smoked before. A lot of the studies mix up smokers, quitters, uh, low smokers, high, high rate smokers. So quite confusing. So we actually went back and got groups who'd never smoked. And if we couldn't get them, we wrote to the authors and got it, or we reconstructed it from the articles. And we recomputed all of the statistics on an intention to treat basis. So if people drop out, people say, ah, oh, well, we're going to treat them with the last observation before they dropped out. So we actually did an intention to treat. If you're randomizing a group, we analyze you in this group. We actually computed the numbers at risk based on the randomization. And um, we found studies involving 450,000 students. 150,000 we were actually able to get cohorts of never smokers. Another 200,000 cohorts where they mix them all up. And then 150 where you could get no data out of them. They didn't tell you what the number is, one of the intervention group or the control group, or they didn't have outcome measures for smoking status. So it's really amazing. A huge amount of work had been done. People have participated and really nothing useful turned out. But we're very, very happy. So we think it's a unique contribution. And what we found out was that um, if you um, use appropriate methods, you can prevent 12% of children starting smoking which in medicine is a good number. And interestingly, if you use social competence interventions and social skills together, or just social competence, so the kid becomes more competent, can talk to members of the other gender, can work out life's crises, you give them a whole bunch of skills, which the kids seem to recognize as helpful to them. If you just talk to them about smoking, they probably see it as an adult figure lecturing to them. 60% of all the trials use uh, skills to prevent you refusing the offer of a cigarette doesn't seem to be useful. So we thought that was a major contribution. Yes. Then the World Health Organization has a huge vaccination campaign for yellow fever. Right. They're vaccinating 180 million people in 39 countries in Africa and 17 countries in Latin America. And they'd had five deaths in Peru. So they, they commissioned an international tri uh, competition, which I won as a family doctor against virologists and statisticians, so it's a first for family medicine. And so we did a review of the entire literature back to 1930 in all languages. So I actually had some of my patients translate some of the languages. I don't, and I translated the rest. So we actually looked at all of the adverse effects um, in all of the um, trials back to that date um, and concluded, in fact, there are only about 131 serious adverse uh, events published compared to the probably 600 million doses of yellow fever vaccine. There are about 350 events that didn't meet the Brighton Collaboration criteria. Brighton Collaboration is an organization that has very carefully specified vaccine harms. Then about another 245 where people said it could be uh, an adverse event to yellow fever. There's just no proof at all. So I thought that was a major contribution from a family physician to the yellow fever literature. And of course, I, as, a yellow, as a family physician, um, I worked as a medical missionary aboard uh, not in a country with yellow fever, but tropical disease very meaningful to me. I thought that was an achievement for a family doctor to do this. So that's another area. And then I've looked at mentoring. So there's a lot of mentoring of children. And we looked at uh, mentoring to prevent children smoking and mentoring to prevent children doing drugs and alcohol. Very limited literature. Uh, some of it at somewhat risk of bias. So compared to the volume of mentoring goes on, there's very little proof that it's effective. Doesn't mean to say it isn't. It hasn't been well tested. Okay. Will the advent to the use of um, EMRs help help uh, the the conduct of systematic reviews in the future? Uh, yes. It's a big challenge right now. It is well in the sense that we review the literature back over the last forty years before EMRs came along. Mm -hmm. To the extent that new articles are published using EMRs, so you get a, a very um, important uh, denominator, a very complete denominator, EMRs will be helpful. Interestingly, very few of the randomized control trials in yellow fever or in tobacco, the areas I'm interested in or mentoring, actually work in family physician populations. So the MR is actually not relevant to my fields of research. It would be to a person who works in health services research, extremely important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tell me about some of your current projects. Okay, so we got the medical home, um, and in New Zealand the idea is, the medical home is a doctor idea, well, 
And so the medical home is actually the, the patient's home. So continuity of care is extremely important. So Calgary Laboratory Services has a unique database of literally millions of tests. So what we're going to look at is see if we can measure continuity of care by who orders the test. Can I find, if you're the family doctor, do you have, can you have a series of patients where you're regularly following them for conditions that are chronic, the family doctors follow patients for? Thyroid disease, um, lipid problems, um, renal failure, there's a whole range of chronic diseases. And then how many of the tests are ordered by walk-ins, because we've got the names of all the doctors, and how many are ordered by specialists. And we're also looking at pointless reordering of tests. So that's, what, that's one measure of continuity of care. Um, I'm also looking at um, drug interactions. Drug interactions are extremely important for um, patients, particularly when you go to policy pharma polypharmacy. I mean, we've heard from this conference that geriatrics is really the, one of the key areas of family medicine. Older patients may typically be on 12 medications. What are the interactions? Most family doctors really don't understand the metabolism of medications through the P450 and glycoprotein systems. So I'm looking in detail at those, looking at drug interactions that family doctors are likely to meet with. And looking also in a fairly specialized way at the metabolism of medications. So some ethnic groups like the Saudis, the Ethiopians, the South Africans will have three alleles of a gene. So they're fast metabolizers. Other people will have two working ones, other people have two one works, other people have none. So this is a problem when you start people on a medication. Are they going to be a fast metabolizer or a slow metabolizer? If you've got a pro-drug that turns into morphine, then you've got a problem. If you're a fast metabolizer, you're going to get a very high morphine level. And if you give narcotics to a mother in labor, the child will be flat when it comes out. So there's um, an AmpliChip, an automated gene probe that uses 15,000 probes to test for these chromosomes. And we've just looked at the uh, reliability, validity, sensitivity, and specificity. And actually, there's very little literature. They've never actually taken one set of data and replicated it elsewhere. And so this is really in its infancy, looking at um, the uh, whether you're a fast or slow metabolizer. It's actually quite important for psychotropic medicines if you've got mental illness. And because some are inducers of your liver enzymes, so I give you the next medicine that's metabolized by a particular set of liver enzymes, you metabolize it fast, you won't get the benefit from it. Or you're a slow metabolizer, you get very high levels. Particularly if you give two inhibitors, you can get very high levels of medication. So we're exploring the relevance of this to family medicine. So those are two other projects I'm interested in. Okay. <clears throat> I'd like to hear a bit about your work in global health with Sudanese Phys Physician Reintegration Program. I think that's right. just fascinating. So Rod Crutcher is the hero here because he worked uh, with great skill to get the CEDA grants. Uh, as you know, these are a 1,000 kids were brought by the Cubans from Ethiopia at the time of the conflicts in about 1990 to Cuba. And they went through various professional schools there, whether they wanted to become a doctor or not, they were told you'll become a doctor. So they were working in sort of meat plants in Brooks. And so Rod uh, found them, got the grant, and there are 16 of them working back in Sudan. So I was one of the teachers on the program, and I was involved in giving them nine months of pediatrics, tropical pediatrics, tropical infectious disease and tropical obstetrics because I was a missionary doctor in Malawi for two and a half, three and a half years. So it's all very, very meaningful to me and have lots of first-hand experience. So they were a fun group to work with. They're all back there. They're all working in remote, isolated areas. We're extremely proud of their diligence in an area which is still uh, conflict. Rod goes back. He says, you can hear the bullets were still passed. So these are real heroes of the medical profession. We're very proud of them. So I had a small part in their education. Okay. Any, any interest in research among those positions? Um, we're very happy, actually, to... Uh, the Kellogg Foundation has given people, doctors in West Africa, computers and uh, disks so they can, you know, link up with satellites. It's quite expensive. So we're interested in CME for them, and I'm very happy to help Rod with that. That's the next step, because they Great. need uh, evidence-based research uh, for malaria prevention, how to do a C-section, screening children for infectious diseases, what's the most effective treatment for worms. They need a large amount of very... In any tropical country, there's a limited number of diseases that you need effective information about. You don't need to cover the whole spectrum of tropical medicine. So that's what that would be the next step. Great. And Rod's actually getting grants for that. Fabulous. That's great. Throughout your career, I'm sure there's many things you've discovered and many things that you've 
noticed, has, is there one thing that stands out for you? Was, has there been a moment when you said, aha? Um, I'm actually going to go to a different area of research. Okay. Um, so I'm very interested in screening children for developmental learning behavioral problems. Okay. So I've just r finished a randomized control trial in Calgary. It's a proof of principle trial. And so what we did, we took some evidence-based tools. One is called the Parents Evaluation and Development Status, PEDS. It's got 10 evidence-based questions. So you ask the parents, do you think your child has any uh, learning or developmental or behavioral problems? How do you think your child is with using their hands and fingers? Do you think your child has any behavioral problems? So 10 questions like this. So if a pediatrician or a family doctor just says, how's the child doing? You don't get very far. Right. Very, very little screening of problems. So this is a, a 10 item uh, set of questionnaires. There's a, an evidence-based mild churn chart, both of which are normed on 3,000 kids in the estates across a, a wide variety of states. We put in the PHQ-9, which is a maternal depression scale. And because um, if the mother's depressed, the child will not develop well. And then we put in the MCHAT, which is a screen for autism at 18 months. Mm -hmm. So um, this was an aha moment when I realized that uh, children have chronic diseases, just like adults do. Um, they're very slow to be diagnosed, they're underdiagnosed, they often only begin to be diagnosed when the kid hits the school system at five, having wasted four years. So that was an aha moment. So I actually found the family doctors extremely uninterested in actually adding a research component to their practice. When I did, I called all my chips in by getting my former residents. They would pass it on to the clinic manager who would drop it because it's more work. They're not interested in research. Don't mind using it. They're not willing to participate. So I managed to do uh, 60 children with great effort. So my next strategy is actually go directly to the community, work with community groups, like uh, mother's groups in mosques, mother's groups in Hindu temples, mother's groups in church groups, right. uh, other groups. If it's the Atheist Society, fine. Um, uh, reaching them directly with screening tools, so they can screen their own kids and also tools if they think their child has got dyslexia, there are very good CDs for that, uh, a whole range of ADHD, OCD, um, very clear descriptive pieces of um, educational material for parents plus intervention tools. So I think I want to go directly to the parents. That was an aha moment when I realized that. Why don't physicians want to be involved in research? Well, a lot of, some did, they're too busy. They just run off their feet and their staff are off their feet. If you go into the typical office, everybody's on the phone, uh, everybody's trying to stay on time. So they'd like to consume research. Um, and interestingly, they accepted it. So we came into the community, into the waiting room 10 minutes early. Parents sat down. We went through it on a computer screen in 10 minutes. It was really impressive how quickly they could do it. Right. It was scored by electronically within a minute, printed off and just given to the doctor. It worked extremely well. So I was very pleased with the proof of principle. And the ones who accepted it liked it, and some are going to carry on with it. But it was interesting how many, you'd explain it to them, and they really weren't interested. Because the RUIC, which is the official screening tool of the College of Family Physicians and the Canadian College of Pediatricians, is not evidence-based. There are no known reliabilities, sensitivities, or specificities. Not an evidence-based tool. Okay. Most family doctors use it and are not aware it's not an evidence-based tool. But the college endorses it. So hopefully we'll go to evidence-based tools. That's my next goal. Okay, that's great. Um, I noticed you've also written some medical biographies. Yes. yes. That um, that must hit. That must be a different kind of research altogether. Completely different. So I I wrote two articles on Rudolf Virchow, who is a very great German pathologist of the 19th century, an extremely courageous person. So he uh, had a very very wide range of research interests. Um, as a pathologist, uh, he was called by the government to go to the Silesia in the middle of a typhus epidemic and did autopsies on kitchen tables. Very courageous, interested person. Um, he was interested in sort of skull anatomy. And he said to the German army, can I measure the skulls of your soldiers? Not surprising, they told him, go take a jump in a lake. <laughs> um, he opposed Bismarck, who uh, is, to my mind, is one of the great political villains of the 19th century. Bismarck had an iron law that the German army, the Prussian army, must always have 
its share of the budget no matter what happens. And Bismarck opposed him. There was a lot of anti-Semitism in the schools. Jewish teachers were very badly treated. Virchow said, I want something done about this. Bismarck would do nothing. So he's one of my great heroes, both as a pathologist. He made many fundamental discoveries about clots and sepsis. And he nearly, he nearly came across the concept of the cell. Uh, so that's why I wrote that biography. Yeah. Extended your, your reach a little bit. That's right. I was actually at the Jane Austen Society in Calgary. All of us asked me to give a talk on Jane Austen, which I did. And I found out that her brother was given calomel, which is actually mercury for abdominal pain. And the local dentist wanted to file her teeth down for a shilling a tooth. So utterly bizarre medical care uh, 200 years ago, which Jane Austen uh, actually very wisely refused. Very good. Quite bizarre. Very good. So the... Um, Medical family medicine research is, uh, I think, starting to come of age a bit, um, but it's been a struggle to get funding, to get yes. protected time for mm -hmm. uh, physicians and others, uh, to get it accepted in the education system. What do we have to do to make family medicine research a power unto itself? Right. So we need to f ask fundamental questions that are of great relevance to patients, that actually improve patient care. We need to link up with the funders and involve them in the research. Generally, I try and do that. So if funders are not interest in, not involved in the research, they won't implement it. They need to be intimately involved in the planning of it. This is a, a very well understood concept. Um, and then you need to put enough work into it so that you have a substantial answer. You need to have a large enough sample. You need to have uh, a very well worked out research question that builds on previous research that will actually change the care of the patient or change the care of the system. You need to have um, experts, if you're not an expert, if it's a randomized control trial or cohort study, work with you on the design and implementation. You need to have a big enough grant to carry it through with a high level of expertise. And you need to have valid, sensitive and reliable and specific outcome measures. So in reading uh, literally thousands of randomized control trials and cohort studies. Very often, and you'll see that actually this particularly in specialist groups like physiotherapists, they'll design it because they actually know the intervention. But the rest of the execution of the study is poorly done. They kind of did not save enough energy or have enough skill to implement the study, so it falls down on all the risks of bias I mentioned. They didn't randomize properly, they didn't conceal the allocation, they didn't blind it, they didn't go to the trouble of making sure there's no attrition of the data. One of the very best studies on smoking was done by the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Institute in Washington, state of Washington, by Peterson and his team. And they uh, followed children for 14 years after the intervention until they were 20. And they stayed in touch with the kids every year with a postcard, making sure they hadn't changed the address. They motivated all the principal and teachers, explaining what a randomized control trial was, how important it was not to drop out. And they, had, they followed 94% of the kids over 14 years, a great achievement. So the other thing is you've got to put a lot of effort into the execution and continued um, work of your study. You can't just delegate it to other people. You've got to stay on top of it every day, making sure things are going well, making sure that a group doesn't drop out. You've got to go around to them immediately. So although I talk to all of the doctors personally in my small proof of principle study of screening children, even so, it was very, very hard to persuade some of the office staff to carry through with it, even with you know, a, a gift of money to compensate them for extra effort. So you need to do a very, very thorough job so that you have a worthwhile and valid answer that people can take and with a low risk of bias. For example, I was presenting all my literature on, on vaccine, vaccine influenza um, to on a poster here, and I was discussing the problem is the poor quality of the research. So with the randomized control trials on adults, um, the randomization was poorly done, and there's a fair amount of attrition, performance bias. In the, some of the studies, quite a few of the people did not get the vaccine. So you have all these problems in interpretation of the study that clutter up the literature, and you can't draw definite uh, conclusions. So that's actually another area that I didn't really mention, is, is really I've done a lot of studies on uh, the Cochrane studies on the effectiveness of influenza vaccines. So I'm the principal investigator of a study. If you vaccinate the, the medical staff and nursing staff who look after seniors in nursing homes, does it prevent them getting influenza? We don't know. There are only three studies poorly done. And if we look at seniors over 65 on that study as well, 
cohort study is difficult to interpret. The cohort study suggests it's effective, but we don't know. And so this is the message. You must do a large enough study. It needs to be focused to answer important research questions that definitely need to change in the care of the person or how the care is organized or how the funders are going to work. And it must be done meticulously with a lot of attention to retaining people in the sample and using valid outcome measures. These are all the things we criticize in studies. So do a study that can't be criticized. That's the challenge. Very good. Um, is there anything that I haven't asked that you'd like your colleagues or future researchers to know about? Um, what, should, what should a future researcher consider in okay. planning? Precisely the thing I've said. They've got to find a subject that truly engages them so that they really, really want to find the answer that will carry them through the long process. They need to focus. Um, I am beginning to diffuse my interests again, having focused them, moving more into sort of work directly related to sort of the medical home and drug interactions, which is good. Um, so they need to focus and they need to build an extremely credible team of colleagues. So you don't get a grant unless all the members of the grant proposal have a long successful publication record and a successful record getting grants. So just look at it and think these guys can't carry it through, we're wasting our money. And you need to be extremely persistent. So you'll get criticism back, you need to get a 4.5 or a 4 to get funded. You need to take account of the criticism and just keep on trying and resubmitting and expanding your team. You need to have a full range of experts and you need to, we stand on the shoulders of giants. So. Um, series of studies have accomplished this. What's the next question? You need to find it and do it. Okay. Anything you have um, you'd like to add to this interview? No, except um, I did another study on Tourette's syndrome. I wanted to work with the pediatricians and okay. look at all their kids with Tourette's. And I approached 60 pediatricians in Calgary and none of them were really interested. It's a little bit specialized. I actually found a ped uh, psychiatrist in Edmonton I worked with. And um, so I actually read all of the literature on teachers who had taught children with Tourette's syndrome and found out their techniques. I assembled them to an educational toolkit. It's like, um, yes, I'd like to use a calculator, I'd use, use a spell checker. I'd like to be able to use the room when I Tourette, I clap my hands or I make some involuntary movement. Um, I'd like to have the teacher address bullying. I'd like to have the teacher communicate with my parents. There are about 80 different maneuvers that the teachers had used. Put them in a kit and um, ask the kids what they'd like, ask the parents what they'd like, and ask the teachers what they like. So it's the classic thing of actually asking the customer. Yes. All of them. And the kids wanted to fly under the radar. They didn't want to sit near the teacher. They didn't want to be singled out. They didn't want to address bullying. The parents wanted every known intervention. And the teachers actually very sensibly did teacher things like structuring the kid, um, looking at the kid's homework quite quickly and marking it, providing the framework for the child, the educational framework. They weren't very interested in getting into the bullying. So that was a very interesting exercise. And also the thing was, it's, it's, I suddenly learned that children have chronic, some of the kids had six comorbidities. They'd have anxiety, depression, Tourette's syndrome, autism, and several other things. So these poor little kids, they need a lot of help. And so the other thing I've learned is that just as older people have chronic diseases, there's a group of children with chronic diseases that begin early. We need to recognize them early, work with the parents, and provide extremely effective resources. It takes a long time to get to the developmental pediatrician. And, and once they get there, actually, the interventions may be very good. I've had kids with autism syndrome who've actually had very good interventions. They're actually higher functioning Asperger's and have really done well. They're still recognizing the Asperger's. They definitely benefit by the intervention. So I think we, in our focus on geriatrics, we don't, shouldn't neglect the children. And we know that the adolescents are the most neglected group. Mm -hmm. They tend to come into the office. People are very busy with the chronic diseases of seniors. And the kids tend to get a fairly short visit. It takes a long while to build up relationship with them. So that's the point of being a family doctor, all ages. Great. Great. Good stuff. Thank you very much, Dr. Stephanie, Thomas. Stephanie, thanks so much. And Brian, thanks so much.